Welcome and thank you everyone for joining the first Ia and Reconet and Baskin webinar on Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and a special thanks to our speakers, Dr. Lima Roberts and Professor Francisca Marte for uh, their availability to run this webinar. So today we will discuss with them the cardiovascular aspects of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I just want to give you a quick note about the speaker. Dr. Robert is a cardiovascular geneticist uh, from the UK, and she is the chair of the medium-sized arteries working group um, of Vascon. And Professor Francisca Marte is a rheumatologist and a clinical geneticist in Ghent University Hospital. And she's also the chief scientific officer of the International Aerodynamic Society. And since 2017, She's also the Ia Enrico Nettinius Disease Coordinator for Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. And now, just a very few information on the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and it will be published on the Ia Enrico YouTube channel and also on our website. If you want to be updated on the upcoming webinar, you can subscribe to, to our newsletter, which is in uh, our own website. And in case you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the question and answer session or the chat if you want. You can find both of them at the bottom of your Zoom window in the black bar. Our speaker will be available to answer your question right after their presentation. Uh, once you have finished watch watching the webinar, we would really appreciate if you could participate to our webinar satisfaction survey. It will appear after the webinar, or you can use the link in the slide if you want. And in this way, we can improve our webinars in the future. Thank you in advance for that. So without further ado, if Lima and Francisca are ready, I would now give the floor to you, to you both. Please go ahead. Um. Well, hello and welcome. Um, I'm going to start, I think, for the first part of um, today's webinar, um, and I'm going to cover, um, let me share my screen first. Um, Okay, can uh, everyone see that? Yes, we can see it, but it's not in presentation. Yeah, now it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, as we have been introduced, we're going to be talking about the cardiovascular aspects of EDS. I'm going to um, cover uh, mainly vascular EDS and uh, kyphoscoliotic EDS and touch briefly on uh, postural or static tachycardia syndrome and exercise in, in EDS. Um, and uh, Francisca, I think, is going to cover most of the other um, uh, EDSs uh, and uh, the cardiovascular manifestations in them. So if I can start off with vascular EDS, I think most of you uh, will know um, of this condition, um, uh, specifically because um, it is one of the conditions is associated with significant arterial fragility. Um, so just because I'm sharing my screen, I'm also moving uh, some of the um, other um, uh, windows that are um, also visible. Um, vascular EDS, um, as you are already aware, it's an autosomal dominant genetic condition caused by mutations in COL3A1. Um, the, this condition specifically um, has a significant risk of um, organ fragility and arterial fragility. Um, has been described um, by uh, colleagues as early as 1998. Um, and you can see some of the pictures there with uh, the typical facial features um, and early onset of uh, aging that also is quite visible. Mutations in this gene um, um, are variable. Um, and depending upon the mutations, the um, variability of presentation is also slightly different. So um, in 2017, I think several colleagues got together to redefine the um, diagnostic criteria for 
um, vascular EDS, and I've outlined that there. Uh, but specifically, as you can see, it is arterial rupture at a very young age, which is one of the major criteria. Um, bowel rupture, specifically colon, um, is also um, one of the major criteria. Uterine rupture and um, parotid cavernous uh, sinus fistula um, has also been noted there. Um, the other features, you know, the facial features that I talked about, um, uh, early onset aging, um, tendon or muscle rupture or hypermobility, all are only um, minor features for this condition rather than um, major, um, as we have noted above. Um, so I wanted to start it off by kind of saying um, what is um, or when does vascular EDS uh, features typically present in individuals. Um, and I think the active phase of the disease for vascular EDS is mainly in the teenage years um, with early onset of um, uh, disease related complications, mainly around 16 to around 20 years, years of age. Um, I'm not saying that um, uh, you know, uh, the features cannot be present in, um, in younger onset, um, but most often it's not so typical. We actually see the disease related complications around um, 16 to 20 years of age. Um, and the complications that most often um, uh, patients present with are arterial accidents, such as um, a dissection, a rupture, or, um, uh, or bowel rupture, for example, um, is also another presentation that can be seen in individuals um, with this condition. Um, this is a, a lovely um, uh, paper um, uh, um, uh, and slide um, from uh, Frank et al, um, where they looked at what is the age of um, first complication um, in individuals with vascular EDS. And as you can see in this curve, um, in the younger onset, and I, know, I don't know if you can see me pointing, but in the younger ages, at up to around uh, 12 to 15 years of age, um, the, uh, the amount of complications is actually quite small, but um, it tends to increase quite significantly from around 15 years of age or so. Um, and again, the, 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 the colors and the dotted lines um, um, kind of separate um, patients who come to us as the first case or their relatives um, or all cases um, uh, in the dotted um, uh, line. So, um, uh, it is important to keep in mind that um, often when we see very young children, the diagnosis may, may be slightly more difficult um, and um, uh, we probably find it easier to diagnose patients with vascular EDS when, uh, when they are in the teenage years or young adulthood. Um, Another nice um, uh, graph from uh, uh, Frank et al, um, which also shows what is the first major complication that can happen in patients with vascular EDS. And as you can see, um, uh, the type of major complication, the vascular ones seem to dominate uh, this graph. Um, again, the uh, first event often is arterial in around 63% of cases. Um, and again, it's separated by all cases, index cases as in the first patient presenting to us or their relatives. And as you can see, the index patient presenting to us or, um, does, um, uh, does actually um, uh, highlight um, that that is often uh, the, the main reason for diagnosis in these patients as well. Uh, so I, I thought I'll touch briefly on the type of arterial complications that patients can have. Um, and the first part, as you can see, a dissection or a tear of the blood vessel uh, with pooling of blood in the, um, in the layers of the blood vessel um, is often the main cause. And it can be seen in around 76% of cases. Um, a rupture as in a complete tear with pooling of blood in the, um, in, in the body um, is also known, but it's, it's a much smaller percentage um, in, um, in around 6% of cases. Aneurysms as in just dilatation of blood vessels um, are also seen. Um, again, 6% of, case, of cases that we have, uh, that Frank et al have looked at. Um, false aneurysms and to a smaller percentage um, arteriovenous fistula and carotid cavernous fistulas are also um, seen. 
Um, so I, I, I thought I'd move on from there and I'll actually touch on the outcome. Um, the, again, it's difficult to uh, look at outcomes based on just arterial um, complications. So um, again, this, this um, graph comes from uh, one of the recent papers from Frank et al in 2018. Um, which looks at the outcome of all patients with vascular EDS that they have followed up in their center. Um, and as you can see, arterial rupture as the cause of death is one of the major causes um, in um, individuals with vascular EDS. And um, they had a total of 100, 103 patients um, who seem to have had um, arterial rupture as cause of death. And one interesting thing that you can probably see in this graph as well is that um, uh, the number of male patients actually suffering um, arterial rupture is actually significantly higher than the female patients as well. Um, and this um, is probably also highlighted um, in the second graph that where the male patients are in gray um, and tend to have a um, higher number of deaths as well. Um, therefore, we feel that men are at greater risk for more complications um, and um, should probably be um, much more monitored as well. Um, if you look at the median life expectancy, which is um, in the bottom end of the, uh, of the slide, um, the, the age ranges um, for uh, men, um, as in uh, life expectancy is around 46 years, but women is slightly higher at 54 years. Um, so does this mean that men should receive more um, investigations than women? I think that is um, no, but men should be monitored and this information may actually be um, more relevant to families and how they accept the information and process it. So other factors that influence cardiovascular um, events, um, of course, depends on the type of mutation. And I thought I'd briefly touch on this as well. Um, so patients with glycine uh, substitutions and splice site mutations often tend to have a much more significant phenotype. And you can see that is highlighted in the first part of the graph in the purple um, line and the green line. Um, people with um, haploid insufficiency, which is in the blue line, tend to um, have less frequent and probably later onset um, uh, complications as well. So if we talk about treatment in, pe in people with vascular um, uh, EDS, uh, medical intervention um, is one of the things that we really do want to consider for these patients. Um, however, um, uh, the amount of um, uh, clinical trials that have been done to, um, uh, uh, to look at um, uh, medical um, agents have actually been quite small. Um, so the main aim of medical intervention is, as you know, to reduce blood pressure with, and to keep it within the normal range and to avoid surges in blood pressure. Um, so beta blockers seem to be the um, main thing that we always work towards. There's only one clinical trial um, that has been published to date with uh, celiprolol, um, which has been shown to have promising results, um, but um, is um, still being debated uh, as to whether um, this is the ideal um, drug to, to use in this condition um, because um, of the small number of patients that were studied um, in this trial. So um, other trials with um, agents such as uh, Erbisartan and Losartan have also been um, looked at, um, although the results are still unavailable. Um, surgical intervention um, for arterial events um, is a must. Um, a majority of um, uh, arterial, um, acute arterial events may not require an intervention um, and can sometimes be managed conservatively. Um, but depending upon the location of um, the um, of the event, we may have to consider open surgery as well. Um, so a specialized team, specifically uh, an, a, a multidisciplinary team with both um, geneticists, cardiologists, and uh, surgical colleagues would perhaps be um, really important in managing these patients um, in specialist centers. Um, minimal invasive um, vascular procedures um, are also um, used, although 
um, secondary accidents or iatrogenic accidents as a result of these in invasive procedures are um, also noted. Um, so uh, best results um, often are, 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 are obtained when um, things are not done in an emergency situation and actually are um, planned arterial procedures, but often um, when a patient presents with acute um, uh, with an acute event, um, um, I think maintaining uh, their uh, blood pressure, maintaining and um, maintaining and their pain, as well as managing them um, in a conservative um, manner, should also be considered uh, before um, we undertake um, any intervention um, or surgical um, uh, intervention. So that was my brief overview of vascular EDS um, and the cardiovascular complications and how you address them. Um, I was just going to move on to kyphoscoliotic EDS. Um, again, this um, was highlighted um, as part of um, the International Consortium uh, Rare Disease um, uh, Working Group that was looking at um, the phenotype. Um, kyphoscoliotic EDS is um, an autosomal recessive conditions and mutations are known in both um, the PLOD1 genes and FKBP14 gene. Um, again, as per the international criteria, there is major and minor criteria that are um, well noted for this condition. Um, and as you can see, major criteria includes muscle hypotonia and kyphoscoliosis, although skin hyperextensibility um, and easily bru bru bruisable skin, um, and perhaps even um, rupture or aneurysm of the medium-sized arteries are in the minor criteria, as is perhaps in per several other um, uh, rare types of EDS. Um, so I'll touch upon um, the PLOD1 related kyphoscoliotic EDS, as you can see, um, it is a progressive condition um, in the pictures below. Um, the first one is a five month old. Um, the second one is a six year old. Um, and the third one is a nine year old. And as you can see, there is, uh, it's not the same child, it's um, siblings from the same family. And as you can see, there is a progression of um, uh, the kyphoscoliosis in individuals as they grow older. So um, people with, um, uh, Kyphoscoliotic EDS, um, who are known to several services, have been looked at. And um, this, I don't know if this information is published yet because I couldn't find a related um, uh, publication um, in the literature. But there are 74 patients with clinical phenotyping um, that were looked at. And in them, um, a, a medium sized vessel rupture was noted in around 11 patients. Um, and what was also um, highlighted was that this was most prevalent in teenage years to young adulthood. Um, and six cases of neonatal um, or antenatal um, brain hemorrhage was also noted um, in um, this cohort of PLOD1 patients. In the FKBP14 related kyphoscoliotic patients, um, there is a publication by Ginter et al, um, which might be worth um, looking at. 24 patients with clinical phenotyping were looked at as part of the rare disease working group, rare EDS working group of the International um, Consortium. Um, and they noted that there were two um, children um, who presented with um, uh, an, an arterial um, complication. One was um, after the history of aortic rupture in a 12-year-old sibling of, uh, of an affected individual. Um, and another was a hypogastric um, artery pseudoaneurysm rupture in a six-year-old. And there were two other arterial ruptures um, in, in, the in a 40-year-old and a 50-year-old involving the carotid and celiac arteries. Um, so uh, although kyphoscoliotic EDS is not a, um, a, a significant um, uh, arterial involvement as um, vascular EDS, it is important to keep in mind that medium-sized arteries are perhaps involved in this condition as well, and therefore further monitoring um, may give us more information in the future. So that was the two main conditions that I was going to cover with um, uh, with the arterial complications. Um, I was also asked to touch briefly on postulot static tachycardia syndrome. Um, and exercise in individuals um, uh, with um, EDS. And I thought I'd do this 
Um, now, before I hand over to uh, Francisca, who will cover all the um, other um, uh, types of rare um, EDS and um, their arterial involvement. Um, postural or static tachycardia syndrome, as I've, um, as I've outlined here, is an abnormal increase in heart rate that often occurs with change in posture and symptoms can um, include dizziness and fainting. Um, it is more common in girls um, and women. Um, so young girls uh, between the age of 15 to around 25, it's more common. Um, although um, people up to around the age of 50 also can experience symptoms. There is a significant variability of symptoms. Some people just find a little bit of dizziness, um, but other people are quite incapacitated with the symptoms that it affects their daily life as well. Um, it is also well noted that this improves over uh, gradually over time and people who have experienced um, these symptoms in their teenage and young adulthood um, tend to um, uh, do not have major symptoms when they are um, uh, in, their, um, uh, in, their, in their 30s or 40s. Um, and there are some medicines and self-care measures that can help with this um, condition as well. So why does this happen? That's the question that we are often asked. Um, it's because the autonomic nervous system does not work properly. Um, a simple way of, of explaining this is if you st suddenly um, stand up, um, there is um, a decrease of blood flow um, to, the, um, to the heart. Um, and, and therefore what happens is um, the heart starts, uh, uh, the heart rate increases in an effort to actually improve the blood flow. Um, and this can then um, cause um, this raise in heart rate and features that are associated with both dizziness um, and, um, and fainting. So um, as I've described in the second uh, line there, blood supply to the heart, the brain, when you change in, when there is a change in posture, uh, might be uh, the reason for um, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, so are there tests to diagnose this? Yes, um, there are, but it is not a yes or no answer in most cases. So I would advise that you speak to your doctor um, rather than um, consider these tests um, uh, on an individual basis. Um, the main tests that I wanted to outline here are a tilt table test and um, an active stand test as, is, as it is described. A tilt table test is where the table is tilted um, so that you get to a more upright position and your heart rate and blood pressure is monitored at the same time. And this is done in hospital in a specially designed bed. Um, and an active stand uh, test is where your heart rate and blood pressure is again measured after you're lying down or immediately after you're standing um, and in uh, periods of two, five and 10 minutes. Um, these are the main, uh, main um, tests that are involved in diagnosing um, thoughts. However, people might also consider investigations such as an ECG, an echocardiogram or a 24 hour tape in some cases as well. Um, so what kind of self-care measures can you take to um, address your symptoms of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome? Um, so the main reason for, um, uh, for this is thought to be dehydration and the lack of, um, um, of blood that flows back into the heart when you suddenly change your posture. Um, and therefore, um, keeping your hydration up um, is recommended. So drinking plenty of fluids um, is, is, is very helpful keeping active so that your um, calf muscles are um, much um, more responsive and are able to pump your blood back into your heart is also thought to be very helpful. Um, Non-impact exercise such as swimming um, or uh, walking um, or Pilates is also um, thought to be helpful to improve your core muscles. Um, symptoms also happen when, um, uh, when people try to lie flat in their bed and therefore elevating your Head end of the of the bed is um, is is thought to be helpful, and in addition, to improve um, your blood circulation, wearing support sites or compression clothing um, is um, also advised. Um, other other practical measures like uh, avoiding long periods of standing or um, uh, getting up from a, a sitting down or a lying position very slowly might also uh, be very helpful. 
um, intake of salt um, to retain some more fluids in your body is um, thought um, is, is advised now. Um, however, it is very care. It's very important that you are careful um, that you do not have high blood pressure and do seek the medical um, help um, where required uh, before um, you change your diet drastically. Avoiding caffeine and alcohol, I think, is always helpful in terms of um, keeping your heart healthy. So these are very practical measures, and I thought it would be um, helpful to outline them there here for um, everyone to um, keep updated. Um, again, medical treatment for POTS, especially when it is quite debilitating, um, is um, is also available, but um, seek advice from a specialist. I'm not a specialist in post-stroke tachycardia, although I do work with my colleagues um, in um, in London um, who are much more well-versed in um, looking after patients with this condition. Beta blockers or evabradine is something that's actually um, used in some of my patients that I've come across, midodrine in, um, in some cases, and fludrocortisone as well. Um, I do not have any of my patients on SSRIs, but um, this is also um, thought to uh, be of help in this group of disorders and should be discussed again with your um, specialist or cardiovascular uh, team before, um, uh, before, it is, uh, before it is started. Um, so that was just my um, brief overview of postural arthritic tachycardia syndrome. In most cases, I think being... Um, aware, um, treating your symptoms, learning to self-manage them will actually be helpful. Um, but when it becomes quite um, unmanageable and debilitating, seeking a help from your um, cardiologist um, who is well versed with this um, disorder might be your best uh, option um, to improve um, uh, your uh, quality of life. Um, and the last bit of my uh, talk was with regards to exercise um, in EDS in general. Um, and as I've outlined in the in my first line, this is not evidence based. Um, there's not enough literature for us to um, say that this is the best way of um, of exercising. But I think most of the um, uh, of the information that's available out there is based on um, practical solutions. Um, exercise is good. Um, so even in Marfan syndrome, for example, we do exercise, uh, we do um, uh, recommend moderate um, exercise to keep your heart healthy, which is around 8,000 to 10,000 steps a day, if poss where possible. Um, that is uh, something that I think we should also be considering for individuals with, um, uh, with any type of EDS. Um, other questions that people often ask me are, how do I stop injuring myself? What type of exercise? Um, and I'm taking a very practical um, um, approach to this. Um, specifically, I wanted to highlight um, a, a, a website called Patient Worthy Contribution. And I really do like their do's and don'ts as they have actually outlined there, um, which I think are fairly practical um, and um, appropriate for uh, most patients with hypermobility and um, EDS. So the do's, as it says, are exercise regularly. Um, and again, it does keep to a non-impact exercise. Walking um, is much more better than jogging or running. Um, and um, um, even um, counting your steps to around 8,000 to 10,000 steps a day would actually be um, very helpful um, to keep the heart pumping. Um, much more uh, um, other specific exercises, such as um, swimming, um, again, avoiding butterfly um, swimming, but uh, just normal um, freestyle might actually be much more helpful. Water resistant exercises and aquatic therapy um, is also um, thought to be quite good um, for individuals with this condition. Um, non um, impact exercise using elliptical um, devices or stationary bikes are also um, really appropriate in this condition. And using small free weights to strengthen your um, big muscles or your thighs and your calf muscles and your core muscles, um, sometimes described as stabilizers, are also very helpful, um, specifically in patients with thought, um, where it might improve their circulation um, a bit more. So the don'ts are, um, again, I think, again, very practical. Um, there is a level of 
pain involved when you do exercise specifically because your muscles are working harder than they should. Um, so um, I think it's very reasonable to say don't stop because of mild or moderate pain, but if the pain is severe, of course, you should not continue with uh, that particular um, uh, exercise. Um, contact sports, again, things like rugby or, um, uh, or football perhaps are uh, not the best um, types of uh, sports to be considering uh, with people um, who have uh, significant hypermobility. Distance running, because it involves a lot of stamina um, uh, as well as um, endurance, perhaps is not the best type of um, exercise. Um, and any kind of professional or Olympic um, weightlifting and crossfits are not um, commended. Competitive exercise, um, um, exercise such as gymnastics or cheerleading, which involves a lot of um, um, the joints, is again perhaps not recommended. Um, so I think the don'ts are very much um, practical ones where if you know that your joints are going to be. Um, significantly impacted during the exercise, then um, it's perhaps best to avoid them. Um, oh, sorry, maybe I've gone back. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, and thank you very much for listening. And I will pass on to um, Francisca um, to do the rest of the rare types of, of, um, of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Thank you very much, um, Lima. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. Um, can you see this? Yeah. My screen? Okay, thank you. Okay, so yes, I um, am indeed going to cover um, other rare types uh, of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And so in this um, table here, you can see an overview of uh, all the types of EDS that uh, have been recognized now uh, with their underlying genetic cause. And I, um, I summarized here uh, the main vascular manifestations uh, that we see for uh, these types. And um, I just would like to highlight here that um, easy bruising is actually something um, that we see in all types um, of EDS. So um, it can be present in varying degrees uh, uh, within one type, but even uh, within one family with the same type. Um, uh, so, but really we see it throughout all the types and it's not for instance, because a patient has easy bruising uh, that this is uh, typical for vascular EDS, uh, for instance. Uh, the bruising in EDS can occur anywhere on the body, uh, including some unusual uh, sites. You see here um, a picture of a girl with a classical type of EDS who has a big bruise uh, on her forehead, but we can also see it, for instance, on, on the back or on the upper arms of children. Um, in, in children in, in different types, um, especially if other um, features are, are less remarkable. The bruising may raise a suspicion uh, for child abuse. Um, we see that sometimes, for instance, in classical EDS or in vascular EDS, and so uh, we should be aware that um, EDS is actually a, a diagnosis that one should think of. Um, and when there is repetitive bruising, uh, the, uh, especially, for instance, uh, on the pretibial area, this area becomes stained with hemosiderin uh, from previous bruises and gives this a uh, very typical aspect. Um, a few years ago, um, our group did a systematic review on vascular complications in uh, what we then called non-vascular subtypes of EDS, so every type except for uh, the vascular uh, type of uh, EDS. And um, we included um, all patients that had been reported with a proven molecular defect in one of the EDS-associated genes, except for the CoL3A1 gene. 
And um, so, um, so this was published um, in 2018, so two years ago. Um, and at that time, there were 467 um, molecularly proven non-vascular EDS patients. And in 17%, per so 77, um, we found a presentation of a severe vascular complication. And uh, severe vascular complications included um, arterial aneurysms or dissections, uh, intracranial hemorrhages, uh, severe perioperative and gastrointestinal uh, bleedings, um, severe hematoma, so more than, than bruising, but uh, really a severe hematoma requiring, for instance, um, surgical drainage. Uh, and then there were a few sporadic other uh, complications. Um, and as you can see here, um, mo about two thirds of patients with musculocontractural EDS um, experienced um, severe vascular complications. And as we will see in this subtype, it's mostly severe hematomas. Then about half of patients with classical like EDS due to tenacin X mutations had complications. And then um, we also see uh, severe complications in the cardiac valvular type of EDS, the, the dermatosparaxis type of EDS um, and the classical type of EDS. And as Lima already uh, pointed out, uh, also uh, the arterial ruptures that we see in kyphoscoliotic type of EDS are maybe um, rather rare, but uh, very important as they um, are uh, associated associated, of course, with an uh, increased mortality. There are a few um, subtypes of EDS, and I'll just briefly go back uh, to the table. Um, a, a few subtypes of uh, EDS, such as, for instance, hypermobile type of EDS, uh, also the arthrochalasia type, um, the brittle cornea syndrome, and the myopathic type of EDS, where we actually, besides bruising, which can also be mild in those cases, we don't see um, severe uh, complications um, to date. Sorry, um, I have to go to the next. So um, about um, uh, one half of the major vascular complications that we saw in the systematic review were the hematomas. And as I already pointed out, we see them most frequently in musculocontractural uh, type of EDS and the classical like uh, type of EDS. Um, and uh, these are mostly uh, subcutaneous um, hematomas. And as I already said, um, they are really different from uh, the common uh, easy bruising and much more severe. Musculocontractural type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is an autosomal recessive condition that is caused by uh, biallelic mutations in uh, these two genes here, CHST14 or DSE. And these both code for enzymes that are uh, very important for the biosynthesis of dermatin sulfate. Um, other clinical features of this condition include characteristic craniofacial features, as you can uh, appreciate from these pictures. Most patients have congenital contractures, such as congenital club feet, congenital uh, finger contractions, uh, but also sometimes of uh, larger joints. Um, and then uh, they have the typical EDS like skin changes. We also see internal complications, but then uh, from a vascular point of view, um, you can see here severe bruising and then here uh, a picture of an example of the, this um, hematoma formation. And um, so it uh, really can be very severe and uh, has been associated with, um, with mortality uh, due to a lot of um, blood loss actually. The classical like type of EDS um, is also a recessive condition that is caused by biallelic mutations in the tenacin XB gene that codes for the glycoprotein tenacin X, and tenacin X is also involved in uh, regulation of uh, collagen organization in uh, the connective tissue. Um, and patients with this condition um, have a um, phenotype that is quite reminiscent of the, the more of the classic type of EDS, 
and where you can see the skin hyperextensibility um, and the joint hypermobility. Um, and patients usually also have severe bruising. Uh, but they do not have the atrophic scarring that we see in a classic type of EDS. Um, other features include food deformities, lower limb edema, muscle weakness, and also vaginal, uterus, and rectal prolapse. But uh, then uh, from the vascular point of uh, view, uh, quite a few patients have been um, also reported with uh, subcutaneous uh, hematoma formation. Other sporadic uh, complications include gastrointestinal bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage in a few patients. Um, another uh, big uh, part of the major vascular complications that were seen in, in other uh, types of EDS include the intracranial hemorrhages. Um, uh, and so they were most frequently uh, reported um, in dermatosparaxis type of EDS. It should be noted, though, that to date only 15 patients uh, have been um, reported with dermatosparaxis EDS, and, and three of them had a um, intracranial uh, hemorrhage. Most of them were uh, congenital. And um, intracranial hemorrhages have also been reported in other rare types of EDS. Alima already mentioned the kyphoscoliotic type, but also in musculocontractural, periodontal, spondylodysplastic, and classical uh, EDS. Uh, the dermatosparaxis type, uh, I just like to show uh, a few pictures here. Uh, that's also an autosomal recessive condition caused by biallelic mutations in Adam TS2, which code for uh, the procollagen pro um, amino proteinase. And also here, uh, mutations in this gene lead to a very abnormal organization of collagen in the extracellular matrix. Um, patients with uh, this condition usually have an extreme fragility of the skin, which is more remarkable even than in other types of EDS. And as you can appreciate here uh, from, from these pictures, um, the bruising can also be extreme. And actually, um, in my personal experience, even more extreme than what we see in other types of EDS. There are a few other uh, specific clinical features. As you can see, they have quite a um, recognizable facial uh, gestalt, um, and uh, they can have tooth abnormalities, um, usually also some fragility of the mucosa, uh, fragility of visceral organs, um, and then as we have already pointed out, the intracranial hemorrhage. Um, arterial dissections uh, can sometimes be seen um, in uh, non-vascular types of EDS. Um, already pointed out by Lima, we see it mostly in the kyphoscoliotic type of EDS due to mutations either in PLOT1 or FKBP14. Uh, but then um, there, uh, it should we should also be aware of arterial dissections in the classical type of EDS. Um, usually, um, these dissections um, are also medium-sized or large arteries, uh, a bit similar to what we see in the vascular type of EDS. And you see here a list of, of the arteries that have been uh, affected in uh, other types of EDS. Um, and on the other hand, aortic dissection is very rare in uh, non-vascular EDS. It was reported in one single patient with a, a mutation in the COL5A1 gene. So the classical type of EDS, um, it's an autosomal dominant condition. And in the vast majority of patients with a, a classical EDS presentation, we find mutations in the COL5A1 gene and then to a lesser extent in the COL5A2 gene. And those are genes that code for type 5 collagen. Um, so they have uh, the, 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 the really typical skin hyperextensibility, the eutrophic scarring, also obviously bruising, and then generalized joint hypermobility. 
Um, and then, um, as already pointed out, arterial dissections um, have been reported. To date, there are 18 classical EDS patients with a proven COL5A1 or COL5A2 mutation um, that have been reported with uh, arterial dissections. Um, so there is no real um, clear genotype-phenotype correlation so far. Um, but um, it's come to uh, our notice that um, those that do present arterial dissection frequently have a glycine substitution, uh, either in the COL5A1 or in the COL5A2 gene. Whereas uh, on the other hand, the vast majority of mutations in uh, COL5A1 are not glycine substitutions, but are actually mutations that lead to a non-functional COL5A1 allele and thus to um, COL5A1 haploinsufficiency. So it is possible that these glycine substitutions uh, perhaps are uh, particularly associated with a, um, a more severe risk for uh, arterial dissections. However, uh, we need to have more observations um, in patients to see whether this correlation uh, holds true. Um, there is a recent um, publication um, uh, here about a uh, COL5A1 uh, glycine substitution in uh, the amino terminal propeptide of the alpha-1 chain of type 5 collagen. It's uh, a glycine substitution to a serine uh, on position 514 in uh, four independent patients um, that were uh, presenting with a fibromuscular dysplasia uh, phenotype. And um, so all of them, um, I think it was through whole exome sequencing, um, um, turned out to have the same glycine substitution. And then when looking uh, in a little bit more detail uh, to the phen phenotypic features, um, these uh, patients uh, appear to have a phenotype somewhat reminiscent of a vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So um, this uh, again shows that uh, although it is rare, we, we should still uh, be aware of the possibility of severe vascular complications in patients harboring um, mutations in one of the COL5 genes, and especially uh, when uh, it concerns glycine substitutions. There is another uh, group of patients, uh, it's rare, but uh, patients that present with a phenotype uh, that uh, looks like classical EDS. And so um, these are the two children that were first reported in 2000 uh, with this phenotype, uh, but that harbor a very specific mutation in the COL1A1 gene encoding the alpha-1 chain of type 1 collagen. And this is a uh, arginine to cysteine substitution at position 312. Um, and so um, these patients appear to present with a classical EDS phenotype, but um, um, we also um, identified the same mutation in an adult patient uh, who was referred because there was a suspicion of vascular EDS because she had a, a rupture of a um, iliac artery, spontaneous rupture at adult age. And uh, clinically, she presented a bit of an overlap between classical and vascular EDS. And her son, who also harbored the same mutation, really had a more classical EDS-like phenotype. Um, to date, 20 patients have been uh, reported with uh, this very specific mutation. And in three out of 20 of them, uh, there have been um, observations of the sections of medium-sized arteries at adult age. Um, there was also one uh, with a vertebral arterial tortuosity and aortic root uh, dilatation. So um, this specific mutation uh, appears to be uh, associated with a somewhat more increased risk for vascular complications. Although as we uh, identify more patients uh, with this mutation, um, it appears that there are quite many of them uh, that have not uh, been uh, experiencing any uh, vascular complications. So again, here, future observations will have to show us 
whether there really is um, uh, the, the, or the risk is uh, higher in these patients than, for instance, in patients with type 5 collagen mutations. But for now, uh, it, um, it is, uh, we, we think it is safe to have a baseline head to pelvis uh, uh, angiography, um, angiography uh, upon diagnosis, uh, specifically for these patients. Overall, um, in uh, non-vascular types of EDS, um, and I'm turning back to the systematic review that we uh, did, uh, mortality seems to be low, uh, and which is um, different than uh, what we see in vascular EDS. So um, it's only reported in 2% out of the, uh, the 467 reported molecularly proven non-vascular EDS patients. Um, so vascular EDS um, or vascular complications um, are the... Uh, um, are the main cause of death in vascular EDS, but it does not seem to be such a, or does not seem to be associated with such an increased risk for mortality in other types of EDS. But we have to be very careful because it's also possible that in non-vascular EDS, mortality is just underreported due to vascular complications. Um, and then um, we also looked at other vascular complications, minor vascular complications. Um, so uh, gynecological bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding, perioperative hemorrhage, um, and then other things such as varicose veins, deep vein thrombosis, gum bleeding, epistaxis uh, is, uh, is reported in all these uh, rare types of EDS, uh, but uh, at present it is not clear um, whether uh, there is a, a really a, a very increased risk uh, for these types of bleedings, which you can also see uh, in the common population. Um, and then um, just uh, uh, two slides about cardiovalvular uh, complications. Um, so in the different types of EDS, uh, mitral valve prolapse prevalence might be increased. Um, in, in, in classical EDS and hypermobile EDS, uh, it has been noted that there might be a small increase in prevalence but um, it tends to be of little consequence. And therefore, um, periodic um, monitoring of the cardiac valves with three to five year intervals, or more frequently, if an abnormality is found, um, can be done, uh, preferably by non-invasive procedures. Um, actually, um, Cardiac valvular abnormalities have uh, not systematically been noted in uh, the other rare types of EDS, uh, except for one, which I will um, which I will discuss in the next slide. Just one word about hypermobile EDS. The vast majority of hypermobile EDS patients do not have signs of aortic disease or cardiac valvular disease. And in this group, echocardiac um, follow-up should uh, be limited to those with a family history, history of aortic aneurysms or those with abnormal um, examin clinical examination. So there is one uh, very rare type of EDS. Um, I think at present there are only about five patients that have been reported. It's the cardiac valvular type of EDS. It's an autosomal recessive condition that is caused by biallelic mutations in the Col1A2 gene. And uh, this is the gene that codes for the alpha-2 chain of type 1 collagen. And uh, these mutations specifically lead to a complete loss of this uh, pro-alpha-2 chain. So there is a production of homodimers uh, of alpha-1 chains of type 1 collagen. And so these patients um, also present with a somewhat overlap phenotype between hypermobile and classical EDS. They have usually generalized joint hypermobility, some skin abnormalities, sometimes with atrophic scarring. 
but um, at adult age, uh, they, uh, they seem to develop a polyvalvular disease uh, leading uh, to really um, necessity to replace the cardiac valves. Um, in one patient, um, oh, I forgot one word. Uh, um, there has been a arterial dissection that has been reported also. So um, in conclusion, um, vascular complications um, are important in non-vascular types of EDS and sometimes uh, also uh, severe. Uh, it depends on the subtype of EDS, uh, and, um, but we should be aware of, the, of those. And so it's not only associated with vascular type of EDS. Cardiac valvular problems are uh, rarely uh, of any consequence except in the cardiac valvular type of EDS. Mortality rate seems to be low compared to vascular EDS. However, uh, we have to be uh, careful because it could be underreported. Um, so, and uh, the limitations to uh, the systematic uh, review um, is that uh, there can be a selection and publication bias, obviously. Um, and also, um, in many patients, there's probably no active screening for asymptomatic features. Uh, and then many of these types are so rare that only a few patients have been uh, reported so far. So um, we are still lacking a lot of information. And future research should therefore also focus on more systematic documentation of these vascular complications to optimize management and care guidelines in uh, these patients. Yeah, and um, that's uh, my part of the presentation. And um, I think uh, Lima and I would be happy uh, to take um, any questions uh, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Lima, again. Any questions from, from the audience? If you want, you can use the chat or the question and answer session in the black bar. Let's give a minute right and then we'll see. Maybe if I can just say something, because um, it's something that um, we see create sometimes a lot of anxiety among patients. And I already stressed it a little bit in the beginning, but um, so um, patients do not have two types of EDS. So when they present bruising, it does not mean that they have vascular EDS on top of, for instance, classical EDS. And that's something that I, I have experienced that there can be some misunderstandings among patients and they, or, or, or even if they have an arterial dissection. I mean, it's, it's, it's the underlying genetic defect that defines whether you have a classical or vascular or another type of EDS, but you don't have two types of EDS because you have remarkable vascular involvement. We can see vascular involvement in all types of EDS most, I mean, as a general um, remark, maybe Lima, you want to add something to that, but yeah. Yeah, so I agree that I think most often um, the referrals or the patients who are concerned who come to me are, yes, we do have a family history of hypermobile EDS, but uh, because I have, um, you know, um, easy bruising or because I have, um, uh, it, there's been intracranial aneurysm in one member of my family, is this vascular EDS? So um, I think often um, that comes up that people think that they may have a different type when compared to the rest of their family or um, that because they have this bruising that they have vascular EDS in addition to having um, hypermobile EDS. And I think that is a, that's an easy misunderstanding that most, uh, most individuals seem to have. Um, and I think that's an important point to um, emphasize um, that easy bruising is present in all cases of EDS, not just in vascular, 
um, and um, it's it, what we are looking at in some um, some of our specialist clinics, specifically when you're looking at arteriopathy or iotopathy clinics, we are looking at conditions which actually cause increase in dissections and arterial complications, and therefore those are the ones that we are trying to identify to treat or manage or surveillance. Um, and we are not looking at easy bruising as um, a, a feature to actually do surveillance in individuals with this condition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. So we cannot see any questions in the chat. So um, if you want, if you have nothing to add, I think we can close the recording. Uh, Okay, we have a comment from Charissa, and she says, I'm glad you repeat these, especially organizations are not believed. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Charissa. Thank you. So, um, anything to add, or we can close? What do you think? Yeah, I think close, and then if questions come, we will deal with them later. Yes, in case you have any question that you would like to ask uh, to the speakers, you can always contact us via our channels by, or email or by uh, whatever you, you feel comfortable with. Uh, we have also Twitter, so whatever you feel more comfortable, let us know if you have any questions or suggestions for the next webinars, and we will be very happy. So before we close, again, Francisca Lima, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your availability. We know it's a very difficult time we're living. So once again, thank you so much for being here today. We're very glad to have had this uh, webinar joined with Vasker and we hope to see many other coming in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, Lima and um, everybody who joined us. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. See you next time, bye. 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 -bye.